Welcome to our 1130 Wednesday lunch and Bible study from Doctrinal Studies Bible Church in Birmingham, Alabama. We want to thank you for uh, attending with us on this Wednesday luncheon. We're not actually holding luncheon here, but I hope I'm having it with you. I hope you will catch us at 1130 on Wednesdays until we're able to invite our people back into our congregation uh, because we have some Situ we have some control over the virus uh, in our community, which we don't right now. And so I'm, I'm meeting with you in your home uh, while you eat and I teach the Word of God. You get a double dose of eating. You get natural food and spiritual food at the same time. Well, we started a new series last week. I had several requests come. When I close, I finished a, a quenching the Holy Spirit, and they had questions about grieving the Holy Spirit. And so we, last week, I started the introduction to grieving out of Ephesians 4.30. Uh, grieve not the Holy Spirit, and that's a command in a negative form. Stop grieving the Holy Spirit. It's a present active imperative. That's a command, second plus, person plural, that's to the entire church body. And so we, we introduced that subject last week, and we carry that subject on, grieving not the Holy Spirit, today discussing deceitful lying. That's really important. Deceitful lying grieves the Holy Spirit. And I want to show you, he's talking about his spiritual aspect. Last week, uh, we learned that there were eight offenses against the indwelling Holy Spirit or, or eight, eight offenses against the Holy Spirit, some of them against the indwelling and some uh, outside, not inside. I'm just focused on those that are offenses against the indwelling Holy Spirit uh, where he lives inside of every church believer, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. And as a result, our body is the temple of God, the naos of God, the place where God, a holiness place where God dwells, and we are, we are a mobile church. Each of us collectively, we gather periodically. Uh, here we meet on Wednesdays and Sundays, uh, Tuesdays in the past. COVID has shut some of that down. But there are eight offenses, and we listed them. We talked a little bit about them. And now one of those one of those is grieve the Holy Spirit. Another one of those, quench the Holy Spirit, we're talking about grieving. We learned that the word grieving was lupeo. It's a present active imperative, second person plural, as I mentioned, and was used. The word grieving is used with God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, the deity of the Trinity or Godhead. We call it Language of accommodations in theology. It's a human term to describe how it affects deity. I want you to remember that. God uses certain terms of, about how our relationship with him works, and he uses it in, her, in human terms in order for us to really grasp uh, the force of it, grieving. Now, most of us, it doesn't take us long in life that we find out something about grieving. I know for me, I was probably around eight or nine when I lost my dog, Brownie, and uh, a car ran over him, and uh, I experienced that whole witness of that. And I grieved for many, many, many years, enough that I, I never got another dog for myself. And so it can have an enormous influence. It's a human term. Even children uh, can understand something about the impact of grieving upon their life. And so God uses that term to describe that you can grieve deity, the, the third member of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit who lives inside our life, John 14, 16, forever. Once he takes up residence, he can never leave. So that's interesting. Now, we're studying the second uh, of the uh, eight imperatives of a lesson. 
that we talked about earlier. And I've listed them. I've listed all the imperatives that we're going to study uh, on your paper. And if you didn't have a paper, of course, you know to bring a Bible, pencil, and piece of paper when you study with us. But here we, we are in Romans, uh, in Ephesians 25 through 32 is the context. And in that context, there are 11 imperatives. 11 imperatives. In the context of Ephesians 4.30, there are 11 imperatives. Ephesians 4.30 is only one of them. What I did is I broke the, the 11 imperatives down into eight lessons. Uh, one will come from 4.25 today, and one from 4.26, one from 4.27, one from 4.28, 4.29, 4.30 I've already done, 4.31 and 4.32. That we're going to do eight lessons on this to teach you the subject matter of grieving the Holy Spirit. So let's have a word of prayer because the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual living. You can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. Confession of personal sin. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins. Why? Because sin, personal sin, is the evidence of a carnality that we're walking in the flesh, not in the spirit. Galatians 5, 16. And so we have personal sin. It could be mental attitude sin, sins of the tongue, avert sins, just give you an example. And what do, I, what do I have to do to get out of carnality and back into spirituality of the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit? I have to confess my sin. I don't confess my sin to be saved. I believe that Jesus died for my sins was buried and raised from the dead the third day. When I believe it, I get saved. But personal sin is a different issue. That's Adamic sin, Romans 5.12. But personal sin is a different issue. That carnality affects spirituality. Personal sin affects spirituality. When I confess my sin, I'm restored by the blood of Christ, working in the Christian life on behalf of the Christian life, to restore me to fellowship with the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to give you a moment to do that. Give you a moment to do that. And so, our Father, we thank you today for these that have come our way by uh, the Internet. For those who are not familiar with our Internet, uh, I encourage them to go to doctrinalstudies.com and pick up our lessons. If they want spiritual growth, they need to study the Word of God. I encourage them to do that today through my prayer. I pray today, Father, as we look at one of the ways we grieve the Holy Spirit is deceitful lying. Teach us about it today out of Ephesians 4.25. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's take a look at uh, your Bibles. If you'll go to 4.25, remember the context, the context the greater context really begins in verse 17. It goes through the fifth chapter, verse 21. <laughs> but I'm looking at the smaller picture of it. My, the ones I'm after is 25 through 32 because it's about grieving the Holy Spirit and it deals with my 11 imperatives. But 17 through 24 is one section, 25 through 32 is another section of the greater context of what Paul is teaching. I just tell you that because it's important to your life. Now I'm going to talk about uh, four aspects of deceitful lying that grieves the Holy Spirit. Deceitful lying. Verse 25. Therefore... Remember, the, the word therefore is a trailer hitch, even though this is an interesting one. This is not the typical un, O-U-N. This is D-I-O, Deo. It means because of this. And it goes back to verse 21 to verse 24. That's important for you to know that. It's worth you writing it down, and later you go back and read it. He says, therefore... And I'll tell you why. See the word laying aside? Therefore, lay aside. The word therefore says, remember what I just taught you, verses 21 through 24. Let's go back and read. Let's just go read it. If indeed you have heard him, 
If you did not learn Christ in this way, verse 23, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him just as truth in Jesus. That, and this is what he's talking about. That in reference to your former manner of life, that's before you came to know Christ, you lay aside the old self that came from the conformity of the world of Romans 12, 2, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit. Now, remember that, the lust of deceit, the lust of deceit. I'm going to come to it in a moment. And that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind. This is how you correct old man thinking. And he's talking to Christians now. Lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind. He's talking to Christians. And put on the new self, the new man, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteous holiness of the truth. That's all necessary for the word therefore. Now the reason is, is lay aside. Look up at verse 22. In reference to your former manner of life, conformity to the world of Romans 12, 4. And what he wants is transformity by the renewing of your mind, Romans 12, 2. Transformity. Now you see the word laying aside is the same word. That in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self. Look down at verse 25. Therefore, lay aside falsehood. Let's go back to verse 22. Lay aside the old man, which is being corrupt. Watch this. Which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit. Verse 25. Therefore, lay aside falsehood. There you have it. What's the antidote? Speak truth. Each one of you with his neighbor who is his neighbor in context? We are members of one another, the body of Christ, the church. We're not talking about the neighbor that Jesus talked about. We're talking about the neighbor of the church. We are members one of another. This neighbor, each of you uh, speak truth, each one of you with your neighbor, for we are one body in Christ. That's a neighborhood within a neighborhood. The church is a neighborhood in the neighborhood. You ought to write that down. You are a member of the church neighborhood in the world's neighborhood. And that's your mission field. Wherever that is in the world. Now, you got a problem, though. You got, to lay, you got to lay aside falsehood, which he's described in verses we read 20 through 24. And then we come to the word therefore. That's really important that you know all this stuff. Is a therefore, because of this, verses 21, 22, 23, 24, lay aside. It's a present mental participle. Falsehoods. There's our word. It has the definite article to. That's the word the. And pseudos. It's an accusative singular neuter. Falsehood. It refers to deceitful lying. Spudas. Deceitful lying. And what's the antidote? Speak. You see, falsehood, deceitful lying, the word speak is laleo. Communicate truth. To whom? To one another, the neighborhood of Christ, the church in the neighborhood. Oh, it's so important you get that. See, a lot of times we read the Bible and don't let the Bible read itself to us. See, what I'm trying to do is read the Bible and let the Bible tell us. I'm just telling you what the Bible is telling us. That's all I'm doing. Therefore, lay aside falsehood, 
deceitful lying and speak. Now, this is a command, present active imperative, second person plural, like grieve not. Except this is positive. The negative is, is deceitful lying. The positive is speak truth. Communicate. Laleo means to communicate, communicate, communicate truth. That is the word of God categorically laid out. See, the category we're studying today is grieve not the Holy Spirit. We're, we're talking about what grieves the Holy Spirit of God who lives inside the believer's life in the church age. Well, the dynamics in the church is not to have deceitful lying going on. It grieves the ministry of the Holy Spirit and the body of Christ, the church. I hope you're getting that. Communicate, communicate the truth of God's word, each one of you with his neighbor. Now he describes the neighbor for this is the declarative conjunction. Why communicating truth is important in the body of Christ because we are members one of another. Aleon is the word, is the form of the word, alas, which means one of the same kind. He's talking about the body of Christ, the church. Now, our subject matter today is deceitful lying. The antidote to that is speak the truth of the word of God with each other. We are told that the only way the spiritual antidote can work is to lay aside falsehood. You've got to lay aside the falsehood, the deceitful lying. Deceitful lying. And you must, you must put it off. It says put off, lay aside or put off. Like a garment. Take off. Take off. Wait a minute. Let me stop this. Grab my coat. Uh, grab my mic. Just give me a minute. Like taking off a coat. Take off and put on. You take off deceitful and you put on. And we're going to talk about how you do that today. And you put on speaking the truth of God. Listen, the only person that pushes deceitful lying is the devil. And the only person that, pu that pushes absolute truth is God. It's a war in the church between Satan and God on the way we behave with one another and how it affects the Holy Spirit, whose job is to keep all of this in harmonious order. We are told the only way that the anti spiritually antidote can work is to lay aside the falsehood, deceitful lying, and then put on speaking truth. And we'll discuss this further in this study. Now, here's my second point, having looked at the text. The source of deceitful lying that grieves the indwelling Holy Spirit is Satan. He's the one who pushes the agenda of the lust of deceit. I'm going to show it to you in just a moment. I'm just preparing you for it. Now, in theology, his whole program of the lust of deceit, his whole program we call cosmos diabolicus. We call it worldly thinking of the devil. Paul in Romans 12, 2 called it conformity to the world. That Satan is the God of this world, 1 John 5, 19. John 12, 30, 14, 30, 16, 11. You know all these passages, or you should. He's the God of this world, 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, 3 and 4. He, he tries to blind the minds of the doubting, unbelieving ones. This is how he, this is how he, he attacks. This is how, this is his mythology. It, it's called his scheming. Cosmos Diabolicus is Satan's scheming strategy against the plan of God revealed through his word, speaking the truth. Satan 
the very word Satan is an adversary, is an adversary against the truth of God. Jesus in John 8, 44 called him a liar. The reason he's a liar, it is his nature. It is his nature. He doesn't have the capacity to tell the truth of God because of self self-incrimination of Matthew 25, 41. Satan's fall, judgment in eternity past, is the lake of fire, eternal fire. That's Matthew 25, 41. Now you're interested. <laughs> That's okay. And Revelation, the 12th, 20th chapter of Revelation, 7 through 10, where he's cast into it. He knows his end. And he's working against the plan of God over this whole issue. I hope you know that. 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 2.11 so that no advantage would be taken of us by Satan. You should go back and read the context. It is the ability to forgive one another. The context. Oh, you should go back and read it. I mean, I, I can't do all this in one hour for you. You should go back and read. So that should tell you I need to read something. The subject is forgiveness. So that no advantage should be taken of us by Satan. Watch this now. For we are not ignorant of his schemes. When I get through with you today, you are not going to be ignorant of his scheme of, this, of the lust of deceit to get you to engage in falsehood, deceitful lying that attacks the plan of God and the will of God inside the church body. And it grieves the Holy Spirit. Let me give you an example of 2 Corinthians 2.11. Let me read it again because you forgot it. So that no advantage should be taken of us by Satan. For we are not ignorant of his schemes. Let me show it to you. In 2 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, verse 3. See, I was in 2 Corinthians 2. Now in 2 Corinthians 11, Paul is still on the subject. Here's what Paul wrote. I am afraid that as the serpent, Revelation 22 says, the dragon, the serpent, the devil, Satan, deceived Eve. Eve, Adam and Eve. This is where the scheme with the human beings began, and he's still running it. We're in, he's engaged in the church in the second chapter, and Paul's identifying that the scheming has been running all through human history. It began with Adam and Eve, and it's still, he's still running the same game. Nah, nah, nah. I'm afraid that as a serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness. You know what his craftiness is about? Write this down. 2 Timothy 2.26. It says, the devil tries to get you in a snare, a trap, so that he can hold you captive to do his bidding, to do his will rather than God's. Ah. In the snare or the trap of the devil held captive to do his will, not God's. That's craftiness. His craftiness is developing snares that can trap different people by the lust of deceit. 
and he has a lot of them. He has a lot of traps because there's a lot of lust in the human being because of his sin nature. And because of conformity to the world, the program the devil runs as a snare-trapping place. I hope you're listening. Crafting us. He is a master trapper. And what is he trapping in you? Your mind. Watch this now. I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness of traps, by his craftiness, your mind, that's what he's after, will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. That's the church. Further reading on this subject matter of Adam and Eve is 1 Timothy 2.14. That You're on your own. You need to read that. I've only got an hour. Therefore, by studying Adam and Eve in Genesis 2 and 3, we understand Satan's scheming against the human being. You should read Genesis 1, 1 through 7. I mean, you should study it, not just read it. Paul talks about this in Romans, the fifth chapter, verse 12, where he talks about Adam's sin is passed on to the whole human race, and we are spiritually dead. We are born, spirit we are born physically alive, spiritually dead because of Adam, not because we sin, because he sinned. You go like, that's not fair. <clears throat> they don't write the book. They don't write it. He is the federal head of the human race, 1 Corinthians 15, 22, and 45. In Adam all die, in Christ all are made alive. That's the antidote. The first Adam and the last Adam, verse 45. The human race is divided into two camps. They have federal heads. The first Adam that sinned and all, men, all, all mankind are under, and the last Adam that came, died on the cross, was buried and raised from the dead, and everybody who believes it is, Colossians 1.13, is rescued from the domain of Adam and transferred into the kingdom of the beloved son. The kingdom of Satan into the kingdom of the son. Woo! You ought to be getting excited if you got any Bible in you. Point number three. This showing you who the source was. Who is the source behind this? Who is, who is attacking in the church? And you understand that. Number three. The deceitful lying we are speaking of in our lesson text is a lie against the revealed truth of the word of God that grieves the indwelling Holy Spirit. Now, sometimes on my paper, I'll have H-I-S, and I'll say indwelling Holy Spirit, because I wrote I-H-S, and the computer corrected me. So I'm correcting it. It irritates me. You can understand Satan's scheming of deceitful lying when you study his attack upon the human race in Genesis 3, 1 through 7. I'm going to read that to you. I, I will, I, we will study it sometime later in the year. I'm going to do Genesis again. Well, I'm just going to, I'm going to lay it out for you to read, to study. For example, I, I, I wrote this on my paper, verses 1 through 3. The serpent was more crafty, and he, he, he has a communication with the woman, Eve, and he asks her a question. You shall not eat from any tree of the garden. Now, he knows the correct answer, but listen, like false news today, 
they, they stack the question. It's how you ask the question. You can make it say, listen, you can take a survey and make it say anything by the way you ask it. And the devil is the guy who invented it. You talk about fake news, he's the guy who invented it. He asked her a question. I see you've been to Bible study. Oh, yes, my favorite. Well, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden, right? Question. The woman said to the serpent, from the tree, from the fruit of the trees of the garden, we may eat. But from the tree, from the fruit of the tree, which is in the middle of the garden. Can I, can I ask you, what, what was the fruit of this tree? Well, I get some of the craziest answers. Listen, I'm a farm guy. I was raised on a farm. I'm a farm kid, you know. All the way, all the way up to my junior year in high school. As a farm kid. You always know the tree, what kind of fruit is by the tree. That's an apple tree. What do you expect to get? Apples. Why? Because it's an apple tree. Well, there's a pear tree. What do you expect to get? I expect to get pears. It's a pear tree. What is this tree called? From the fruit of the tree, which is in the middle of the garden, God it says, you shall not eat from it, nor touch it, lest you die. See, you go back to verse 17, second chapter, verse 17. It tells you, from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. Well, I mean, you got to figure that out. From the fruit of the tree, what was the fruit of the tree? <laughs> Okay, now I'm just asking. If, if not, why, you don't know where apples come from. You think they came from cherry trees. But from the fruit of the tree, which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, watch this now, you shall not eat from it or touch it, lest you die. She added this idea of touch, and he went, cha-ching. The serpent said to the woman, you shall sure, surely not die. For God knows in the day that you eat, your eyes will be open and you will be like God. There's your problem. That's Satan. You know, if he can sell you this goods, you're going to be in his trap, and his trap is with a little g. Oh, you're, you're, go you're going to be trapped by God with a little g, the God of this world, 1 John 5.19. The evil one. He, he tried to pull this on Jesus. He tried to pull this on Jesus, his humanity, in Matthew, the fourth chapter, 1 through 11. And your eyes will be open when you eat from the tree of knowledge. You'll be like God, and you will know good and evil. Well, the rest is where, human history, is where human history begins. The rest of the story is where we, we come from. Isn't that interesting? You should read that more carefully. I mean, I just picked out a few highlights. You need to study that. You know what you need to be aware of? The serpent is crafty. See, we just read that. We read that. In 2 Corinthians 11, 3. See, you don't know that or you don't believe that. Now, you know it because I told you, but you don't know it because he, he I mean, he plays the fiddle and you dance to his tune. Yeah, I'm just saying. Some, at some point, you've got to wake up spiritually. Pseudo-truth is what he sells. 
is falsehood. He sells falsehood. He develops surveys that will produce falsehood. My, my, my. Pseudo-truth is the falsehood. It's deceitful lying. It's used by Satan to attack the revealed truth of the word of God, or what we call the directive will. He did it with Adam and Eve. God said, don't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The day you eat, die, and you will die. The devil goes, no, you'll be like God. You will really experience what good and evil is all about. Join my team. My, my, my. You know why they, you know why Eve didn't pay attention to the word of God? She went to church and she got the gist of it. There were some doubts about it, and he nailed her. If she had doubts, she should have went back to Bible class the next day and asked the father, what in the world do you mean if I eat? What if I touch it? What if I what if I nibble? No, a nibble is eating. Oh, well, well, I don't know. I mean, what we know is he's crafty and he works the lust of deceit. He works in you off the lust of deceit. Listen, deceitful lying, now get this, is a willful lie. The deceit is Satan's disguise of it. He disguised a lie as truth. He disguises a falsehood. It's his bait on the trap. But in the end, you have to, you have to go for the bait. It's volitional. You go like, ooh, this, this is kind of scary. There's a little cage here. There's a little wiry thing here and and, uh, but I really want that, uh, that uh, right there in the middle there. I really want that, but there's kind of a narrow gate here, and but it looks safe enough. Uh, I don't know, let's, um, but I really want it. Let me smell how good that is. Mm, oh, it's something good. Oh, something I really need. I want that bad. You don't know it's the lust of deceit until you grab it, and the cage stops, and you're trapped. The question is, how do you get out of it? God knew it, and he has a source for you to get out of it. It's called 1 John 1, 9. <laughs> Confess your sin. My, my, my. You sit inside that cage, and you whine and cry, and you beg for mercy, and all you have to do is confess your sin. Trapped by the devil. Got so many Christians today trapped by the devil, by the lust of deceit. But listen, you can't get out of it until you acknowledge the falsehood of it and begin to speak the truth. It's not enough to confess, well, I'm here by my own choices. Nobody made me do this. Nobody put a gun to my head. Nobody did that. So... Where did that get you? That's not confession. That's acknowledgement of stupidity. That's acknowledgement that you were ignorant of his schemes. He's a trapper. The devil is a master trapper. Acknowledging that you got trapped is not confession of sin. It's confessing of your personal sin. It's such an easy solution, and you make it so difficult. You know where the difficulty was for you to confess your sin? People say, well, boy, that's an easy way out. An easy way out? Look at the cross of Jesus Christ, who said six hours on the cross for your sin. Go see the passion, <laughs> the movie. Get some, listen, that was nothing. That's just the human side of it. Wait till the lights go off. And for the last three hours, he suffers spiritual death. Not human death, spiritual death. 
my, my, what's wrong with you? As a Christian, you should be, what's wrong with you? Deceitful lying is a willful lie. And that's what has to be confessed. It is actually a lie. Now listen to me. This is actually a lie you tell to yourself before you say it to anyone else. You do dress rehearsal. Study Adam and Eve and study it out at least down to verse 13 where they get into the blame and excuse game for not taking responsibility to obey the truth of the word of God as revealed to them. Don't eat of the tree. You got all these other trees. Freely eat. Not this one. That's your life, ain't it? It was for freedom that Christ set me free. Verse thir that's verse 1. That's Galatians 5.1. Verse 13. Don't use that freedom for an opportunity for the flesh. Gratification of the flesh. To take a little piece of cheese that's going to trap you to do the devil's will. And he will not let you out of that trap ever. There is no way you'll get out of that trap on your own. You can go to a thousand rehab centers. You'll never get out of there. You'll just trap, you'll swap that trap for another trap, for another trap, for another trap. He'll just change the trap. He'll take you out of one and put you in another. And you think, oh boy, I'm free now. Oh no, you're not. You're still trapped. You haven't dealt with the issue. You haven't dealt with your sin and the deceit connected to it. The falsehood that you keep telling yourself today, trying to convince yourself, my, 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 am I talking to anybody today? Am I talking to anybody today? Listen, there are 1,001 traps that he's got for you. Do not be ignorant of his trapping. He's a master trapper. You got to be smarter. And you are in Christ. You are in the word of God. You can outwit him and beat him any day. All you do is put on the full armor of God and walk worthy of your calling. My, my, my. What is wrong with us in the church of Jesus Christ today? We're trapped by the virus now. My, my, my. Who sent that virus? Not Russia. Not China. Nobody but God. And for what reason? To bring a spiritual awakening in your life. You will fall for the craziest stuff. You will buy into falsehood in a minute because you don't understand where this is coming from and what it's about. It's about a spiritual awakening in your soul. My, 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 what can I tell you, Church of Jesus Christ? And why has this thing affected the whole world? It's time to wake up. The Church of Jesus Christ cannot be asleep at the wheel because the world is underneath it. The wheel. And we have been sent by God to rescue people from fear and bondage and doubts. And the church is filled with it. Like this is the only crisis you're ever going to have in your Christian life. What are you going to do with the doctrine of undeserved suffering? Dear hearts, Philippians 1.29 it has been granted by God for you to suffer as you have believed. He's called you to believe and to suffer for Christ's sake, not for the virus' sake, but for Christ's sake. My, my, my. You can't talk to your neighbors anymore because they bought into this, this mask business. My, my, my. If they talk, you can't understand them. They stand so far away from you.
Let an emergency come up in your life. Oh, I need gas. Oh, I need food. Oh, I need medicine. Oh, I need this. Buddy, if they told you to put the mask on or take it off or uh, wear, a, wear a, a blanket, I mean, it, wear straw in your hair, I mean, at what point are you not going, oh, my goodness. My, my, my. Mm-mm-mm. Judas Iscariot. In Matthew, the 27th chapter, in verse 4, in verse 4 of the betrayal of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, the greatest teacher that ever come, the miracle worker, yada, 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 about Jesus Christ, he had seen it all. Here's what he says. In the betrayal, in the actual betrayaling and taking his 30 pieces of silver. And he's trapped in Satan's iron trap. How's he going to get out? Listen to what he says. Matthew 27. I have sinned. Good start. By betraying innocent blood. Good start. You're on the right path, buddy. You want out of that cage? You want out of that cage that you went into for 30 pieces of silver? You want out of that cave? You want out of that cage? Yeah. What's your deal? I have sinned and betrayed innocent blood. Absolutely right. But that confession will not get you saved, Baba. You've got to believe that Jesus came into this world to die on a cross, be buried and raised from the dead the third day. That Jesus you've been following, he's the Savior of the world. Confess that. Believe that. And we're out. In the midst of all the remorse of sinning against innocent blood, he hung himself in the cave. Inside that cage, he hung himself in the midst of the cave. My, my, my. He went suicide. He could have went salvation. He went suicide. My, my, my. Am I talking to a veteran today? West went through the 4th of July. Is there a hole in your heart, buddy? Are you filled with muck and mire and misery and you blame it on a war? If you're blaming it on the war, you've been trapped inside the cage. God has brought this into your life to bring you to Christ. Stop blaming everybody and stop accusing yourself. Well, look what I've done to myself. I don't deserve to live. What are you talking about? Every person deserves to live. That's why Christ died, so that you can live. He died so you can live. Why are you talking death? Oh, my, 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 my. You can be delivered from that cage and bondage, but you've got to believe that Jesus died so you can live, that he was buried to give you everlasting life. And that everlasting life will not only be for eternity, it will be for now. He will get you out of it. Colossians 1.13, he will rescue from the cage. He will put your feet on solid ground. He'll put a sword of the word of God in your hand, and you will fight the devil till the day you die, and you'll be happy for it. My, my, my. Help us, Jesus. We're so lost in our own selves like Judas's carrot. It says that Judas felt remorse and he returned the 30 pieces of silver. That won't get you out of the cave, Bubba. And so in the midst of his muck and mire, that could be so easily, the Lord will cleanse you with his blood and deliver you. But you got to believe. You got to believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ that he died for your sins to get you out of the trap of Satan and to deliver your soul Cleanse 
As far your sins as far as the east is from the west. I mean a real cleansing. I'm not talking about this superficial stuff. I'm talking about the real deal. Where you become a new creature in Christ, a new creation, born again. My, my. You listen to the devil and you go out and you hang yourself suicidal. My, my, what is wrong with you? What is wrong with you? You know why he committed suicide? Couldn't live with himself. You know why Judas is carried, killed himself? He hung himself. You know why? He hung himself. Nobody else hung him. He hung himself. That's how bad he felt about himself. He committed suicide because he felt so bad about himself. My. Christ died so you could live for him. You don't need to die for yourself. You need to die for the Lord. It was granted unto me not only to believe, but to suffer for Christ, not suffer for yourself. You need a cause that's righteous from start to finish, a cause that is righteous. I'm going to give you, a, on point number four, I'm going to give you a home study. Our lesson text, which is Ephesians 4.25, gives two spiritual antidotes to deceitful lying that grieves the indwelling Holy Spirit. Do you know what those two things are? Well, go back and look. Open your Bible. You still with me? <laughs> open your Bible back to Ephesians 4.25. You got to put off falsehood, deceitful lying. The worst deceitful lying ever is what you tell yourself. Come on, Eve. You got you to put off falsehood, deceitful lying. And you got to speak the truth, doctrinal truth. You got to speak the truth of the word of God. You got to speak it to yourself until you, until you understand it. When you speak it well enough to yourself, like falsehood, you speak it to yourself until you can speak it to other people. Speak the truth of God in your soul. Come to understand it, believe it, trust it, love it, then share it with others. Communicate truth. John 8, 32, it is the truth that sets you free. Galatians 5, 1. Yes, Christ has set you free, free indeed. <laughs> oh, I wish for that. Oh, how I wish for that in your soul today, my dear of hearts. How I wish for that. How I wish it upon the other nations of the world that we might touch. Oh, how I wish that for you. I wish for you to find the neighborhood of the body of Christ, the church that teaches the truth of the word of God for you. We will feed you from Birmingham, Alabama, as far as we can and as long as we can. But if you're in the Birmingham area, you need to come to this church and be fed the word of God. If you go to a church like this, I, I'm thankful for it. If you don't, you need to be in here where you can be thankful for it. When you look at the study guide that I've given you under point number four, I divided Ephesians 4, 17 through 32 into three parts that all deal with grieving the Holy Spirit. And I want you to study it. And I want you to come to the conclusion that there are two spiritual problem-solving devices for deceitful lying. I'm going to call the first confession of your sin, 1 John 1, 9. I put on your paper 8 and 9. 1 Corinthians, the third chapter, 1 through 3. Not on your paper, but should be. Uh, uh, by the way, you need to correct on your paper. It's 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3. 
and you should write down James 1, 14 and 15. That's how you restore the Christian life from carnality, personal sin, into spirituality, the ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit. And the second thing the writer tells you about grieving the Spirit is to lay aside deceitful lying, falsehood, and put on speaking the truth. Speak the truth, each one of you, with his neighbor. Your neighbor? Yes, you are, the, you are members of one another, the body of Christ, the church. So that's as far as I can get today. On Sundays, we're in the book of, we're in the life of Elijah, just about to close out chapter 17. Well, we encourage you to come and visit that. If you have a church of choice, that's great. And uh, pick us up on our web. You can pick us up on Facebook or YouTube or all the other things there. Just check our website out, Doctrinal Studies. Current Studies would be one that would be good to look at, our current studies. So, Father, we're thankful. These that have taken the time to visit with us from the lunch table. Uh, I know for some we probably ran over a little bit, but they can pick it all back up if they're interested. We're told today not, not to grieve the Holy Spirit by deceitful lying. And we've tried to explain it the best we could, Father. Father. I pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth, not to grieve the Holy Spirit. This is lesson two. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.